Special Counsel Robert Mueller is a mystery man, perhaps the most private public figure in Washington. But as the leader of the Russia investigation, he's also at political ground zero. I think the public trust in this whole thing is gone. And in the sights of a president who wanted him fired. Last June, the president ordered the firing of special counsel Robert Mueller back down after the White House counsel threatened to quit putting Mueller in the bizarre position of investigating whether the president tried to fire him. But you'll never hear about it from Mueller. I mean, this is someone who has turned down more press conferences and interviews than most people in Washington ever get the chance to give. He doesn't really like talking about himself. He doesn't really like speaking with the press. At the start, Mueller was a bipartisan favorite. He would have been on anybody's list of, let's say, the top five people in the country to have you know, taken on this kind of a responsibility. We all need to let Mr. Mueller do his job. I think he's the right guy at the right time. With a long resume. At 73, he's been involved for decades in some of the Justice Department's most celebrated cases. Mobster John Gotti, Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega, and the Pan Am 103 bombing in Lockerbie, Scotland in 1988, a case that still remains personal. I'll never forget the visit I made to Lockerbie where I saw the small wooden warehouse in which were stored the various effects of your loved ones. A white sneaker, a Syracuse sweatshirt, Christmas presents, and photographs. He's been effectively the same Bob Mueller in every place he has ever worked, whether that was the U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco in the 1970s, whether that was the George H.W. Bush administration in the 1980s, whether that was the D.C. Homicide Prosecutor's Office uh, in the 1990s or the FBI in the 2000s. He is hard driving, he's tenacious, he is incredibly thorough and has a very strong sense of right or wrong not Republican or Democrat. Four and a half years of whatever, 2,000 meetings, I didn't hear him say anything political. Really? In Washington? Yeah, I know that sounds weird. He might have said that guy's a jerk. I didn't see it as a partisan issue. How would you describe his politics? Not. As he's in a, there are none? He's there? not, he, he's apolitical. He's nonpartisan. He is uh, a, as I think has become quite clear, a pretty law and order guy. Um, but he doesn't speak of things in political terms. Which is partly why President Bush picked him to run the FBI in 2001. The FBI must remain, remain independent of politics and uncompromising in its mission. Mueller arrived at the FBI just seven days before 9-11. He served most of his term under Bush, and when President Obama asked him to stay for two more years, it required an act of Congress. The Senate approved 100 to 0. His M.O., a by-the-books guy, even after hours. People told me after the Christmas party, I mean, while we're going to the director's house, a guy who never really interacts with us, that at the end of the party, that he would flick the light. So it's going 7 to 9 at 9.03. It's like, well, it's uh, on the invitation. It's 7 to 9. It's 9.03. Lights on. That's kind of a signal. <laughs> Married for 50 years to a former teacher, the father of two daughters, there still wasn't much small talk about family at work. A literally buttoned up and button-down boss. I remember telling him, director, you wear a white button-down shirt every day. Can you wear like tattered saw or something? I asked him finally, years after he had been director, you know, what was the deal with the white shirts when you were at the FBI? He said, I understood I was leading the FBI through a wrenching period of change. I wanted to wear the white shirt because I wanted the other FBI agents to be able to know that this was still the agency that they had signed up to join. His dress code as unforgiving as his work ethic. He was in the office between 6 and 6.30 every morning, and he would always plop his briefcase down on the chair opposite my desk, not sit down and kibitz or, or shoot the breeze immediately, what's happening, what's going on? What if you're not a good briefer? Then you're done. <laughs> and you're done. done. And you're done. I mean, the boss likes a good briefer. People used to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and 
and study for two hours before briefing the boss. It was like the big test of the day. There's not a lot of back and forth. Very quickly, you're going to go through the details of the case. Would you assume that he is managing the special counsel investigation the same way? Oh, that heck yes. I wouldn't assume it. That, that is his, it's not like a p professional choice. That's his DNA. What's going on today? What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? I don't want to hear a lot of noise. I want to hear what the facts are. Let's talk about it. What's your judgment? What do you think? Okay, next, here's our decision. Let's move on. Let's go. I never saw any security or nervousness, ever, ever. Ever, never? Never. The pressure on Mueller now as special counsel is intense, but he's seen worse. You forget this is a man that in his early 20s fought in Vietnam. I don't think there's anything in Washington that's going to give him any type of fear that he faced when he was a young man. Muller grew up in the wealthy Philadelphia suburbs and attended an elite boarding school, a classmate of John Kerry, then to Princeton. But the combat death of classmate David Hackett in Vietnam inspired Muller to join the Marines. He was wounded in combat, shot through the leg, received a uh, Bronze Star with Valor, Purple Heart, and you know was right back in the fight a couple of weeks later. I always did consider myself fortunate to have lived through the war in Vietnam, and there were, there were many men such as David Hackett who did not. And in some sense, you feel that you have been given a second lease on life, and you want to make the most of it to contribute in some way. After graduating the University of Virginia Law School, Mueller soon found his way to the Department of Justice and remained there for most of the next four decades. My colleagues here at the Department of Justice, past and present. With two short breaks to give private practice a try. Bob Mueller has been notoriously unhappy every time he has tried to be in private practice. He just can't defend guilty people. He'll meet with a client, they'll explain his problem, and he'll say, well, it sounds like you should go to jail then. <laughs> you know, that so he'll it, tell his client. It, it sounds like you're guilty. Bob Mueller is, is someone who sees the world in very black and white terms. By 2004, Mueller was running the FBI when his phone rang. It was James Comey, then Deputy Attorney General. It was the first time Mueller and Comey would find themselves in a very controversial legal drama. I was very upset. I was angry. Comey was worried the Bush administration was determined to keep a warrantless eavesdropping program that Mueller, Comey, and their boss, Attorney General John Ashcroft, thought was illegal. But Ashcroft was in the hospital, recovering from surgery, leaving Comey in charge. I was concerned that, given how ill I knew the Attorney General was, that there might be an effort to ask him to overrule me when he was in no condition to do that. Called Director Mueller, with whom I'd been discussing this particular matter, and who'd been a great help to me over that week, and told him what was happening. He said, I'll meet you at the hospital right now. They had to literally race administration officials to Ashcroft's bedside. Director Mueller instructed the FBI agents present not to allow me to be removed from the room under any circumstances. In the end, Ashcroft backed Comey and Mueller. He enlisted Bob Mueller because he knew that Bob Mueller had this incredible nonpartisan reputation in Washington. While Comey might be able to be personally blamed for having political motives or thinking politics, no one was going to be able to attach that label to Bob Mueller. That was then. Now, Trump views their relationship with suspicion. Well, he's very, very good friends with uh, Comey, uh, which is very bothersome. Mueller loyalists deny it, but it's all part of the new landscape as he investigates the president. In Congress, we just assume politics infects and invades everything. And it has. News of disparaging text messages about Trump led Mueller to remove a member of his team. I think they're devastating. They're beyond showing political preferences. It very much impacts people's perception of fairness. Then the president declassified a document challenging the FBI's professional behavior. I think it's a disgrace. What's going on in this country, I think it's a disgrace. The intended message to Mueller was clear. Your investigation is contaminated. Mueller remains silent, instead letting his work speak for itself. He is the best hope 
to produce a product that my fellow citizens can have confidence in. It will not come from Congress. Let me assure you of that. It is not going to come from a bunch of politicians. I hope it can come from a former Marine who is the head of the FBI and a U.S. attorney, but he's got to be mindful of the perception. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I'm going to wait on the product that he produces.